Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to this webinar on the availability of data about the journey to work. My name is Oliver Duke Williams, and I'm going to be talking about uh, data from uh, census microdata and longitudinal sources, and some other sources available from the UK Data Service. And I'm joined by Vasilis Rutsis, who's going to be talking about uh, census origin destination data. Today's webinar is one of a series of webinars run by a group of ERCRC data and methods services. In this webinar, we've got contributions from Celsius, the Centre for um, Longitudinal Study Information and User Support, and from the UK Data Service. And the other webinars in this series Again, join together two different sources of data with speakers talking about the availability of data on different subjects uh, from different sources. Both the, <coughs> excuse me, the sources in which they're specialists and with some mention of other sources as well. So on March the 19th, we've got a webinar coming up on ethnicity and migration. On March the 27th, on data about obesity. And on April the 2nd, on data about <coughs> excuse me, education. And further information about all of those can be found uh, via the UK Data Service events listing. So, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, I'm going to talk about census microdata and longitudinal data, and then talk uh, briefly about two other sources of data that contain information about the journey to work. After that, <coughs> excuse me, Basilisk is going to talk about the census origin destination data, which are again a different form of output that's released as part of the census. So, what data are available about, <laughs> about journeys to work in the UK? Well, before we even get on to considering that, I want to pose a question to you who are listening to the webinar. And that is, how do you usually travel to work or to your place of study? So you should see that on screen now, and we've got five possible answers. Okay, that seems to be settling down, so we'll uh, close that poll now and show you the result. So what we can see is the largest group of people said they travelled by train or tube, and after that, bicycle was the, or, or on foot, was the next largest uh, mode of transport to work. In fact, this question is not as simple as it might initially seem. And these are some of the big questions that might have occurred to you when you were trying to answer that. Do you use more than one form of transport to get to work? Do you combine your journey to work with other activities? Do you have different places of work on different days? Do you leave for work from different addresses on different days? I also thought about answering this question by seeing what Google recommended to me. So I typed into uh, Google the search term commuting to see what sort of pictures it showed me. And according to these pictures, we see that people mostly travel to work by, by car or by train, some people by bicycle, some people are walking. And we also see that unlike today, it's rarely rainy. So how can we explore these ideas more carefully using data? Well, I want to talk about uh, census data and about some other sorts of data. And the first of those that I want to talk about today are census longitudinal studies. Uh, sorry, census longitudinal studies and census microdata. And there are various types of question that are asked in the census. And these include the location and characteristics of the workplace, the relationship between a workplace and a residence, the distance between the workplace and the usual residence, and method of transport, as well as the, all the other characteristics, uh, socio-demographic characteristics that we ask people in the census. Census microdata <laughs> are often referred to as individual data. We have one record per person. And there are two types of microdata, regular cross-sectional microdata and longitudinal microdata. And they're broadly similar. They contain all of the original responses to the census from an individual, 
with the identifying characteristics such as name and address removed, and with some responses rounded. If we think first about the census microdata, I'm going to show you some information about what's available. There are various samples, and over time they varied both in terms of sample size and access arrangements. And fuller details about all of them and how you can use them are available by the website that's, <coughs> that's shown on the screen. I should say that all of our slides will be available after the webinar, as well as a recording of the webinar. These samples were first introduced, samples of microdata were first introduced after the 1991 census. And they were known as the samples of anonymized records. And although that term was only strictly used in 1991 and 2001, you'll find that many researchers still refer to uh, these data collectively as samples of uh, anonymized records. And you can see from this table that we've got uh, quite a significant variation in sample size. So the original sample of individuals in 1991 was a 2% sample. In 2001, there was a 5% sample available, and also, with more secure access, a 1% sample of households, which have more detail. Since 1991 and 2001, we've had both a new sample of microdata from the 2011 census, and also, retrospectively, some samples produced from all the censuses from 1961, 71, and 81. Those three older ones all have the same structure. There's a 1% open sample, which is useful for teaching, a 5% safeguarded sample of individuals, or 0.95% sample of households, and they're ideal for research and are very easy to use. There's also a 9% sample of individuals that's available <coughs> via secure uh, data services. And they're clearly richer than the 5% samples, but make more requirement on the user of how to register um, to use them. You have to be an accredited researcher. The sample sizes for 2011 are broadly similar. If we think about longitudinal data, uh, I want to look first at the ONS longitudinal study. That was the first of the longitudinal census data sets that we had in England and Wales, uh, that we had in the UK, and it focused on England and Wales. And it was a 1.1% sample of individuals. And that sample comes from selecting four birth dates throughout the year. And four over 365 and a quarter gives us a sample rate of 1.1%. In the ONS longitudinal study, we've got census data from 1971 through to 2011, and there's some administrative data, and most notably, perhaps, mortality data. So when people in sample uh, have died, we get a linked uh, record of their uh, cause of death. There are also studies, similar studies, in Scotland and in Northern Ireland. Both of them have bigger samples. The Scottish LS has a 5% sample, and it has data, a census data from 1991 onwards. The Northern Ireland LS has a 28% sample, uh, with census data from 1981 onwards. And both of them have more administrative data linked to them than the ONS LS does. And you can't get information about all three of those from calls.ac.uk. If you want to use the longitudinal study, then we've got two access routes. You can either use them in person at a secure setting, or you can submit uh, Stata or SPSS, etc. scripts to be run remotely by the support officers of the various studies. In both cases, no data can be transferred out of the secure setting until it's had disclosure clearance. I've got some examples here of data about the journey to work from the microdata and the longitudinal study. Firstly, this is a, um, a bar graph <coughs> produced showing two modes of transport to work from the 2011 census microdata. So this, this image has a, 
advance, I think. Um, on the top, we've got users of bicycles, and on the bottom, we have people who walk to work. And it's worth noting that they've got different scales. But we can see that there's a considerable difference between men and women of users of both modes of transport. Moving on to look at some work from the longitudinal study. Using longitudinal data, we can look at changes in people's behavior over time. So one thing we've looked at is whether, <coughs> excuse me, whether or not people keep the same mode of transport for their journey to work over a 10-year period. And the data I'm going to show you are a very rudimentary analysis of this because they don't take into account change of address or change of workplace. But I'm going to show you some information about people who used a bicycle to travel to work in 2001 by their mode of travel to work 10 years later, the same people 10 years later in 2011. And you can start to think about whether or not you expect people who cycled to work in 2001 to still be cycling in 2011. Probably some of them have changed to a different mode of transport, but how many? Are the majority still cycling, or is it only a small minority? Well, we can see the result of that here. So this is a Sankey diagram. On the left-hand side, we've got the, all the cyclists in 2001, and they're divided up into their outcomes on the right-hand side. Uh, 10 years later. So <coughs> uh, the largest single group of them have moved from cycling to work to using the car to get to work. The next largest group of people are those who are still cycling. But they're a small minority of the initial cyclists in 2001. We can look at this uh, for more than just one mode of transport. So the table that I'm going to show you on the next page uh, is arranged as shown on this slide. As rows, we've got mode of transport in 2001, and as columns, we've got mode of transport in 2011. The central diagonal uh, are people who maintain the same mode of transport over a 10-year period. And here we have the results of that. So the central diagonal are people keeping the same mode of transport. And you can see uh, towards the bottom and right that people who are still cycling 10 years later are 30% of the original cyclists. So that compares with a 34% rate for people traveling on foot, uh, maintaining the same mode of transport. <coughs> and at the other end of the spectrum, 82% uh, of people who drove to work in 2001 also drove to work in 2011. The table's shaded by the most common 2011 outcome and the second most common 2011 outcome for each uh, 2001 mode of transport. And you can see, in almost all cases, regardless of what mode of transport people used to get to work in 2001, their most common uh, mode of transport in 2011, 10 years later, was to use the car. The two exceptions to that are people who uh, got the train or the tube to get to work. And we could take this idea forward, as I said, by considering more uh, characteristics of these people. Had they changed their address? Had they changed their place of work? How had their degree of seniority in their occupation changed? And we can get that from all of the other census characteristics that we have available to us. We can also, using the LS, consider <coughs> excuse me, uh, characteristics such as workplace location. And this illustrates some of the things that people have to think about when using longitudinal data or any form of uh, dispersive data. Workplace location is given every 10 years to varying levels of detail. In 1971, it was available at local authority level. And in 2011, it was also available at local authority level. But in the 1991 and 2001 results, we we're only given a location indicator. Uh, is it in the same district, a neighboring district, uh, a different district, and so on? However, despite that, it's in fact possible to use much more detailed workplace location data. The longitudinal uh, studies, uh, all three of them, have, as well as general user available, 
fields, they have restricted fields as well. Those aren't normally available for researchers for use, but on request they can be used and are typically used to generate derived variables. Similarly with distance to work, there's variations. In, 1990, in 1971, there wasn't in the main body of variables a, a field for distance between workplace and home. However, in the restricted variables, we have both the, <coughs> the ward, excuse me, the ward of usual residence of the person and the ward of their place of work. And using that, it would be possible to generate a derived distance measure and to include that in your output. In 1991, we had uh, banded distances in various uh, categories, uh, 0 to 2 kilometres, 2 to 5 kilometres, 5 to 10 and so on. In 2001 and 2011, we had much more detailed observations of distance between uh, the place of work and the residence. However, despite that, even though those uh, distance measures are very detailed, we still can't use them as users, as researchers, we can't use them in the output if they're going to be disclosive. The distance between any one district and another may well be unique, and we don't want to be able to reveal that level of information. So the user will typically have to create their own distance bands. But unlike the state in 1991, where they were uh, pre-prepared, it's possible for users to indicate their own distance bands that they want to use that suits their own study. You'll note from both this slide and the previous slide that detail, excuse me, details of the journey to work in 1981 uh, haven't been included. And the reason for that is that despite the fact that a question was asked in 1981 about journey to work, uh, that information wasn't captured in the LS. The most commonly used question regarding the journey to work is the mode of transport that people use. And this questions had similar but not identical response categories uh, in each census and in each of the three uh, countries in which censuses are run. So in England and Wales, in Scotland, and in Northern Ireland. And the next three slides I'm going to show you summarize the response categories used in England and Wales, in Scotland, and in Northern Ireland. So first of all, uh, these are the response categories for England and Wales. And we work from, from left to right over time. So the left handmost column is 1971. I've left 1981 blank. And you can see that most of the categories are the same, albeit with slightly different wording. Although we do have some variation. So in 1971, there's only a single category for train, whereas in 1991 later, that's been separated into both a uh, mainline train and an underground or light rail service. In 2001 and in 2011, uh, we have taxi as a mode of transport, which wasn't included explicitly before. This table shows the response categories for, 19, <coughs> for, for Northern Ireland. You can see here that the data for Northern Ireland was captured in the uh, 1981 LS uh, sample. One of the notable things about the response categories in Northern Ireland is that in 1981 and in 1991, there's a difference between uh, public transport buses and buses uh, uh, provided by employers. And so this indicates, this demonstrates that the response categories are slightly different between different parts of the UK. The other element that's different for Northern Ireland is the both a car or van pool. So that category isn't used uh, elsewhere in, in England and Wales and Scotland. Um, if you are part of a car pool, then in England and Wales you'd be recorded as being a passenger or perhaps a driver in a car or van. Finally, these are the response categories used in uh, the SLS in Scotland. And you can see again, those are very similar to the to the other sets of categories. And again, we see taxi coming in in 2001. And there have been variations over time in all of them in the way that people who work at home have been recorded. I now want to talk about two other data sets 
um, that may be of interest to people who want to do research on the journey to work. The first of these is the, the National Travel Survey. This is a very long-running uh, study. It was, the first survey was conducted in 1965, and uh, follow-up surveys were done with various intervals. But in recent years, um, it's been conducted on an annual basis. And the difference between the National Travel Survey and the census is quite significant. The National Travel Survey is based on detailed travel diaries completed by people talking about their journey to work and many aspects of their journey to work and other trips that they make. Um, and I've copied a quote from some of the documentation here. The National Travel Survey is primarily designed to measure long-term trends in travel and is not suitable for monitoring short-term trends or year-on-year -year changes. So it's a very different sort of beast to the census. The National Travel Survey provides microdata, and this is available by the UK Data Service. And it focuses on five different uh, elements of journeys. On households, on vehicles that are available, on individuals, on specific trips, and then on stages within those trips. And this is especially relevant for multi-purpose trips. I mentioned at the beginning when I asked you how people got to work, um, that it's not, particularly, not necessarily a simple question. And people might make journeys that involve more than one activity. Um, going to work, doing some shopping, or attending a relative who needs care on the way home, or collecting a child from school, etc. The way the data are constructed, we can uh, generate aggregates of data across these uh, different categories of microdata. And data are typically produced for a multi-year period uh, in order to get a large enough sample size. I've got one output that I generated from the National Travel Survey here to show you. So this is for data from 2002 to 2016, which is the most recent uh, phase of the National Travel Survey, and this gets updated when new data are available. And it's showing uh, as rows the mode of transport used, and as columns the stage within a given trip. So some trips have, so, some trips have one stage, other trips have more than one stage. And we can see that for the first stage within a trip, which might be uh, the only stage. Uh, uh, <coughs> I should have highlighted the cell above this, I'm sorry. Um, the most common transport mode used was being a driver in a car. The cell I've highlighted is the second most common mode, which is being a passenger in a car. When we start to look a bit further on, at the second stage of a trip, so again, we're not including here, all the trips that only had one stage. Then the most common mode of transport for the second stage was using a train. As we get further on in a journey, with later, later stages, then walking becomes more significant. And walking, for many people, will be the last stage of their trip to work or to somewhere else that they're going. But you can see from the totals at the bottom that as the number of trips increases, so we're dealing with a smaller and smaller number of trips. Understanding society is one of UK data services' um, major data sets that it supports. And again, it's a longitudinal study uh, collected from individuals in a sample of UK households. And it collects <laughs> a large number, it asks a large number of questions to, to panel members. And some of them, many of them, include information that's relevant to the journey to work. So this page here highlights questions that are asked that relate to transport and the environment. And those include questions about commuting behaviour, uh, about mode of travel, and about other elements that might be relevant to the journey to work, such as people's attitudes towards the environment. We can also, it's also possible within understanding society 
before we get around to using the data, to search for various different sorts of field. So here, these are the results of using the search term uh, transport, and we can see a large number of different questions are relevant. And this list continues to scroll down the page. I've picked just one of those, and this is uh, a page generated from the documentation, so it's just showing us overall figures. This is the frequency of using a bicycle, uh, as reported by people in Wave 8 of Understanding Society. And the question asks about frequency of using a bicycle, um, and we see, unfortunately, for those of us who'd like to promote um, active modes of travel, that uh, the last category is that people use a bike less than or never uh, once or twice a year. So I've talked about four uh, groups of data, longitudinal census data, census microdata, understanding society, and the National Travel Survey. And most of those are available <laughs> via the UK Data Service um, with different sorts of license arrangements. So for example, census microdata have open, registered, and secure variants, and similarly with the National Travel Survey, there's registered, special license, and secure variants. And as we move through those categories, the data become more detailed, but require a greater level of training and authentication of the person using the data. The longitudinal data are included in the UK Data Service um, catalog if you explore the holdings, but with a pointer to where you can actually get a hold of the data. Um, the CALLS AC UK website gives information about all three of the studies, and they all have their own individual websites which give further detail and information about how to use them. To use the longitudinal data, you need to be an accredited researcher and to have your project approved for use. And now I'm going to hand over to Russell Liss, who's going to talk about a, another one of the census data sets for the census origin destination data. Okay, thank you, Oli. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk to you about the journey to work data that is derived from the UK censuses explain some of the main characteristics as well as show you how to access some of this data by the UK Data Service website. So in, usually in our language we use the term flow data instead of journey data. So what are flow data? Flow data are also known as interaction or origin destination data and they consist of counts of flows between two locations. Uh, they are produced at different spatial scales, sometimes associated uh, with various aggregate and pseudo-spatial areas like overseas, work at home, uh, workshop store, and others. So the data sets available are from 1981, 1991, 2001, and the latest 2011 census. So uh, all types of census data stem from con co questions that derive from um, the census questionnaire. So uh, regarding the workplace tables, these are based on question 40 which is in your main job, what is the address of your workplace? So all flow data from 1981, 1991, and 2001 censuses are publicly available to anyone interested in them. Data from 2011 is a bit more complicated because they involve multiple levels of access based on trade-offs between spatial and attribute detail. These factors determine the table granularity and thus the required level of access. The, the, the three levels of access are the public level, which is available via ONS, Domis Web, and the UK Data Service. Uh, the safeguarding, uh, which is available through the UKDS uh, to all members of academia, uh, local and central government, NHS. And the secure level, uh, which requires uh, approved researchers to register through the approved research scheme via the ONS Secure Research Service. Uh, which was formerly known as VML or Virtual Micro, uh, Microdata Laboratory. So now uh, this slide shows some of the most common geography levels of uh, which workplace tables consist of. Uh, I will help you understand the level of the spatial detail of the available information. The geography levels can range from a few hundred areas, as in the case of the local uh, authority districts, to more than 200,000 for output areas. 
Therefore, the lower the geography level, the more accurate and granular the picture we get for specific areas within the UK. So along with the spatial detail, the census tables are defined by the variable detail as well. So in this slide, you can see some indicative variables most commonly found in workplace census flow data. So for example, it's, uh, age, country of birth, national statistics, socioeconomic classification, ethnic group, industry, and so on. So the, type of, the types of table counts are based upon the variables detail. The most simple flow data table is a flow headcount table. These consist of simple totals of people as seen in the case of WF01B UK. The slide provides information on how to distinguish and understand flow data uh, by, the code, uh, by the code names. A slightly more complicated uh, table is a univariate table. It relates to just one single variable. In this slide, uh, it refers to um, an age variable of people aged 16 and over. So the most complex and more granular tables are the multivariate tables, where one variable is cross-classified by at least another. In this case, the method of travel to work variable is cross-classified by two variables, sex and age. So this is probably the most granular table we currently have, at least in terms of variable detail. It was originally a commission table, but ONS released it as a safeguard as well. So based on, upon the spatial variable and count type levels, the workplace tables are classified in a way as shown on this slide security classification schema. You can see that the less detailed local authority headcount tables are publicly available, whereas on the other hand, the much more detailed output area multivariate tables are secured and accessible only to approved researchers. So time for some basic stats. So the total number of public and thus safeguard flow data tables that are posted on Wiki are 290. Of those, one, uh, 108 are workplace tables, of which 94 are 2011 census, 85 of them being safeguarding, and just nine being public tables. So the vast majority of the workplace tables are univariate. There are a few headcount tables and just three multivariate safeguarding, uh, which are all uh, was, were initially uh, commission tables that were later released as safeguarding. So briefly how to access the data, uh, to access the census data, uh, the flow census data, you need to visit the UK Data Service website, click on the census data, and as soon as the next page loads, you click on the flow data from the quick access panel on the right hand side of the screen. So on the next table, uh, the next page, sorry, you click on Wicked, that will lead you to the main website. So there are two main routes to the available data. The first one allows users to download complete bulk, bulk tables in other CSV or SASPAC software format. The other option allows users to run flexible queries and retrieve subsets of tables based, for example, on particular areas and or specific attributes. So to get the bulk downloads page, you need to click on the wiki downloads icon in the main flow data page. Bulk downloads are only available for the 2011 census data, and this is the only route available to download SASPAC files. To query the database and retrieve subs subsets, click on the wiki icon as shown in this slide in the data selection, uh, uh, select the commuting and journey to education data. This option is available for all UK census from 1981 to 2011. So a reminder that if you wish to download safeguarding data through Wicked, then you need to log in using your UK institutional account and you need to have already registered with the UK data service and have already accepted the end user license. In any other case, the safeguarded tables will be grayed out and you will be unable to download any safeguarded data. Finally, these are some links that you might find useful. As always, right on, um, you will receive those uh, once the webinar is over. Yes, we'll yeah. um, circulate details at the where we, you, know, you can get the slides um, after the webinar, <coughs> um, but it will be via the UK Data Service website. Yes. Okay, so thank you, uh, Vasilis. Um, yeah, so question which we've got um, some questions from from users. Uh, so first of all, whilst we were running the poll, 
Um, there's a question about whether or not it's possible to make multiple selections about mode of transport to work. And the poll that we did, we tried to replicate the question asked in the UK census forms as far as possible. Um, and those <laughs> census forms only allow you to tick uh, one mode of transport. <coughs> Excuse me. Questions about mode of transport to work are, are asked in many censuses. And other censuses in different countries allow you to tick uh, more than one mode of transport in some cases. For example, the Australian census allows you to tick all that apply. However, in the case of the UK, we can only pick one. But that's just the census. In other data sets, such as the National Travel Survey, um, it allows the users to respondents to give a very detailed answer about what's available to them, uh, about what modes of transport they use. So I talked in discussing the mode of transport, uh, sorry, in, in discussing the National Travel Survey, that we can split trips into multiple stages. And each of those stages in a trip can have a different mode of transport. Uh, one further thing that might be worth mentioning in that regard, in terms of the census, is that we can also do mode of transport uh, by whether or not the household has cars available, um, which gives some idea about um, alternative modes of transport that might be available to people. Another question we've got is uh, to ask, I'd like to, be available, I'd like to be able to relate travel mode data to some measure of health. Do the data sets have any measure of physical and or mental well-being? Um, I'll start, I think, with, <coughs> excuse me, with understanding society. And understanding society in some of its waves has got very detailed biomarker uh, information. So that's with clinical observations made through blood tests and uh, similar uh, measures. And that gives very detailed health information about individuals. So that can be related to uh, information elsewhere in understanding society about the journey to work. In terms of the census, um, the health information in the census is somewhat limited. Um, we have self-reported general health and we have, again, self-reported um, do you have an illness that is limiting a long-term illness that's limiting in everyday life. And we can relate both of those ideas to mode of transport used. As I mentioned in the longitudinal study, we also have mortality. So we can see both the fact that someone has died, and we know the age at which they've died, but we also know their cause of death. And so we can relate that directly in the LS to the proportion of people uh, sorry, to the mode of transport used by people. So if you're interested perhaps in, in death uh, due to various um, diseases related to pollution, uh, I have no idea whether the numbers are large enough to study, but we might be able to disaggregate different modes of transport used by deaths through respiratory disease and so on. Uh, another question we've got, can you clarify what 1% meant in the data? Is 1% of the population in England, is it 1% of the population in England who took the survey? I'll go, there's uh, a couple of places where this was mentioned. So I'll just uh, go back up the slides to where I was talking about sample sizes. So in terms of the census that uh, Vasilis was talking about, uh, the census is a mandatory instrument, so everyone should complete it. Uh, in practice, not everyone does, but the response rate is, is in the high 90s. Um, so when I was talking about the uh, samples of anonymized records and the longitudinal study, um, I mentioned 1% uh, samples here for the 91 LS and a 1.1% sample for the longitudinal study. And both, those are both samples of people who've completed their census form, in effect. The construction of the ONS sample is slightly different, the ONS longitudinal study is slightly different because um, it can uh, ingest individuals uh, 
from information in the NHS. Um, but broadly, it's people who've completed their census form. Um, if we assume that to be the whole population, then it's 1% of the whole population of England and Wales. In practice, it's 1% of almost the whole population of England and Wales. Okay. Are there data available showing journey times for those looking for work who may be classified as unemployed? Um, the, so I know the National Travel Survey has information about journey time. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Understanding Society has information about journey time. I think in the case of Understanding Society, that's uh, explicitly stated as a journey to work, uh, so that the, the length of time taken. Um, so that might, might not be entirely relevant for people who are unemployed. But in the National Travel Survey, um, because different purposes of trips can be identified, not just work, but all sorts of different purposes, um, then you could look at travel time for people who aren't traveling for work, people who are traveling for other purposes. Okay, what, uh, another question, what software would you recommend to manipulate or analyze the flow data? And in practice, what packages work best for representation? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, some people use, still use the good old Excel, but it largely depends upon your technical background and also the amount of data that you want to analyze. So if it's something rather small, then Excel should work. But if you go to, if you want to download larger data sets, then you probably need to go to SPSS or load the data through R or Python. Uh, many people that, uh, currently use R for both uh, analysis and uh, for uh, visualization purposes. Um, so I would recommend to load the data in probably SPSS and then try to work with our Python or whatever you are more comfortable with. But uh, this is the latest trend to load the data in our Python. Yeah. The data for uh, <coughs> all of these, I think, are available in a variety of formats. So you can um, load them into whatever your preferred mm -hmm. system is. Um, OK, so we're, uh, so follow up to the question about the, um, the sample, uh, the 1% sample of the population. Um, in the case of the census microdata, so the samples of anonymized records and the other samples that, that many people refer to as, as samples of anonymized records, they're a random sample. So a random sample of individuals or a random sample of uh, households. In the case of the longitudinal studies, in all three of these studies, it's selected on the basis of date of birth. So in the case of the, uh, the LS in England and Wales, that's four dates of birth. And those dates of birth aren't disclosed. So um, no one, apart from the people who actually have to do linkage, know what those dates are. All we're told is that they're distributed throughout the year. But that gives us a 1% sample because it's four out of 365 days. With, in the case of Scotland, for example, I think it's 20 days that are used so 20 over 365 gives you a 5% sample. The way those dates are arranged, the, the four ONS longitudinal study dates form part of the 20 Scottish dates, and the 20 Scottish dates form part of the larger number of dates, birth dates used in Northern Ireland. OK, a question following up about analysis. Has anyone, to your knowledge, used uh, K9, I don't know if I've pronounced that the right way, or Rapid Minor to analyze the data which you presented today? Not to my knowledge. I mean, most data science analysis is currently used by using Python. Uh, so, no, I haven't heard it. Yeah, I, don't, I haven't heard people using that. Most people I, I talk to as specialists that use Python or use R. Uh, and for sort of heavy duty processing of the data prior to visualization, uh, they might use, uh, load it into a SQL database and do manipulation within that. 